Um, welcome back to our Planetary Chats here at EMA Talk, a conversation show where we chat with experts about all things environmentally related. I am Eric Christian Olson, a board member of the Environmental Media Association. Um, and if you look outside, it's spring here in sunny California, although it feels like summer. The pandemic is still rolling and what variation, I have no idea. I'm just going to say it's on stage 23 of 25. That's my scientific and, and professional POV. Uh, and we are in a, uh, a really interesting situation uh, with gas prices hitting a, uh, an all-time high of $17 a gallon here in Los Angeles. And so people are starting to think about, you know, maybe this is a good time to, to reduce our fossil fuels. Uh, and I'd love to think that's because we're here to protect Mother Earth. But really, I think we adapt uh, the easiest through innovation and also when we can feel it in our checkbooks. Um, and so the question no longer is, do I buy green? The question is, what kind of green car do I buy? And so I've gathered up a bunch of questions from friends and families and people on the internet um, for you to help us explain because you are a bona fide legion in the alternative vehicle innovation. Uh, you guys have been cranking out hybrids for almost three decades, uh, you specifically. Um, and it's, uh, it's always time to find a new ride. So you're going to help explain to me the difference between electric and hybrid and plug-in hybrid and fuel cells and, and whatever it is that Doc Brown was rocking in Back to the Future. Uh, so with no more further ado, let me introduce everybody to Cooper Erickson, who is Group Vice President of Product Planning and Strategy for Toyota Motor North America. Uh, he is responsible for product planning, pricing, cross-car line technology, and advanced product strategy. Welcome, Cooper. That's a hell of an intro. Thank you. I'm not sure I can live up to that intro, but I'll you're give it my be, damnedest. You're going to be great. But first off, I really, I really want to know, because we were just chatting before we, we started this thing, and, and you've been working for Toyota since college. I want to know, like, where are you from? What that family life was like? And what's the catalyst to dedicate your life to such a singular kind of vision? Well, those are some great questions. That wasn't on the uh, the questionnaire earlier, no, but I, I see where this is going already. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I grew up in Washington State, small town, um, you know, western part of uh, of the state, and I went to college at, in Oregon, Oregon Institute of Technology. I got a technical degree, and right. that happened to be one of the colleges that Toyota went to to recruit product engineers and field technical specialists uh, from. So career day, I interviewed with a bunch of companies, and frankly, at the time. Toyota wasn't as big as they are now. They're very right. successful, great quality reputation, um, you know, great cars. So I figured this is a great opportunity to learn from an amazing company and see where it goes. I had no intention on being there now 31 years. <laughs> so, yeah, so I've, I've traveled. Um, I was in a field organization for a couple of decades. I've had many positions in headquarters now uh, for about 10 years. Um, I've been uh, VP of marketing for Toyota, VP of marketing for Lexus, but for the last four or five years, I've had this product planning responsibility. And we look at products and portfolio and strategies going out, you know, 10 years. So there's a lot of stuff I can't talk about. I'm sorry, <laughs> but there is some stuff. That oh, we'll I get can. to that. Those things, well, that's <laughs> the first question I'm going to have. So my, my family's relocated uh, uh, eight times with me. My wow. son, when he moved to Southern California, that was his seventh relo and he was 12 years old. Um, surprisingly, I'm not sure how, but I've gone 31 years with one wife and my kids uh, still like me. So uh, that's, a, that's a lifetime achievement award right there, I think, for me. Yeah, and they're also learning resilience and grit. There's all sorts of books out that those kind of moves and, and regrouping is, is great for kids now. But I want to know, so, but you, you're a kid, you're up in, the, in Western Washington, you're close to the Cascades. What's the catalyst? Like, what is like, what happens in life that says, I want to start doing this engineering? Like, what, what happened in, that, that led to that instead of going into literature or, or, or you know, entertainment yeah. or finance? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a rural part of, the, um, part of the world up there. And, you know, the culture is outdoors. Yep. It's, it's hunting. It's fishing it's motorcycles and it's yeah. automobiles. It, it's just, that's in the blood. I mean, if you grew up in the, in the seventies and eighties, that that's the way it was. So my dad, um, you know, at a very young age, got me a motorcycle. I was five years old. I had a motorcycle and we had, you know, like 35 acres of land and hills and mud. And so frankly, it started where 
in order to keep riding, which I come home every day and ride motorcycles, I had to figure out how to work on it. So I started to learn how to work on my motorcycle to keep it running. My dad was kind of handy. He bought and sold used cars and he sold real estate and was a school teacher. Wow. Um, so, so we just had a great opportunity to learn that. So I got gasoline in my blood, so to speak. And so I, I really was wanted to be in the car business. Um, I wasn't sure how or where, um, but coming from the Pacific Northwest, I have such an, a great appreciation for the environment and, and keeping it pristine that I think in this most recent job, I use that as a reminder of keeping the Pacific Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. And you being from Eugene, I'm sure you can respect that. It's not quite as good as Washington, but no, it's, you know, not, it's close. But, we're close. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so interesting because that really is the perfect blend of like engineering these machines, that gasoline in your veins, but also this deep appreciation, you know, for, for the planet. And I think, you know, when, especially when you join Toyota, one of the few, if not the only uh, car company that kind of had that in their mission statement, right? I mean, you guys were the first to do hybrids. Is that, is that part of the mission statement for Toyota, this, this reduction of greenhouse gases? Is that built into the DNA of the company? Well, yeah, fuel economy and, and you know, reducing your carbon footprint is the DNA of the company going back to our beginning. I mean, fuel efficient, smaller vehicles, you know, Japan, they're limited on natural resources. So it's, it's natural that they think that way. Um, but it's always been about efficiency. And I mean, when I came to the company, that was, that was six or seven years before we introduced our first Prius. Um, what year is that? What's the first Prius? What year is that? 97. That's unbelievable. 97. So a quarter century now, ago, uh, <laughs> we introduced the Prius, but 10 years before that, our company was deep in researching what to do to dramatically improve fuel economy and reduce emissions. And back then it was actually fuel, hydrogen fuel cell technology was being researched and um, gas electric hybrid, which turned into a Prius. Right. And at the time there was some technology breakthroughs that needed to be done for hydrogen. It was way too soon. So the decision was made to go with um, a, a hybrid system and that was the launch of the Prius. That's unbelievable. So how long have we been looking at that? It, it's it's kind of the DNA of our company. It's the yeah. only thing I've really ever known uh, working for our company. And that's amazing because there's so many car companies now that are just trying to make the pivot based on, you know, the financial and business model, but you guys were doing it before anybody. Like that's commendable. That's, that's, uh, I respect the heck out of that. And that's actually can lead into a question, which is that, you know, I'm having this conversation with my mom who had the first hybrid 25 years ago. Um, and she's looking for a new car and she's like, you know, Toyota's so late to the EV game. And people have said that, like, how do you, how do you respond to that statement? Yeah, um, I understand. Um, you know, there's high expectations for us because we have been a pioneer yeah. in, in the environment. And I would say there's probably no car company that's done more to help the environment over the last several decades than, than Toyota. Um, but, you know, it depends on how you look at it, I guess is, is my answer. And, and I'll give you a few perspectives. One perspective is, you know, right now, um, battery electric vehicles, and there's a lot of different definitions for EVs, by the way. So I just I want to be clear, it gets really confusing because we have, you know, four different types of EVs, right? We have hybrid electric vehicles. We have fuel cell electric vehicles. We have plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and then of course, battery electric vehicles. So when, when people say EV, I think they're referring to, well, they are referring to battery electric vehicles, so zero emission battery electric vehicles. So um, sometimes we say electrified and we include all of those. So we don't want, I don't wanna get confusing, but the bottom line, um, and maybe I already did, <laughs> but the bottom uh, line- Well, I might have to have you break those all down for me because <laughs> even somebody who I felt like I had a handle on it just got, my mind got blown a little bit right there. Yeah. There's four versions of it. So there's a standard battery electrified plug-in. So that would be no emissions. And then and then walk us back from that. Okay. So I'll spend a moment on that. I love so, this. Let's spend a moment. Um, there's two of these options are zero emission. And okay. two of the options are dramatically reduced emissions to, to different extents. The two that are zero emission are fuel cell EV. So a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle like the Mirai sold in California yep. um, is an electric vehicle. It just uses, stores energy with hydrogen, and then it uses a fuel cell to convert that hydrogen into electricity 
to power the vehicle. So it is an EV, but it's a fuel cell EV. So FCEV is our designation for that, zero emission. And you guys are the only one that has that fuel cell car, am I correct? No, there's been other vehicle companies that have had fuel cells. Um, we have sold by far the most. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, we're pivoting that technology now. We're going to continue to support the Mirai, but we're building out the infrastructure and we're looking at heavy duty trucks. And for every one class eight diesel truck, we can take off the road and convert over to fuel cell. I don't know how many cars that equals, but it's a lot. And yeah. we're, we have this great portal project with the Port of Los Angeles, uh, a partnership with Freightliner, and we're upfitting these trucks with fuel cells, two fuel cells from a Mirai. Uh, just opened a line in Georgetown, Kentucky, building these fuel cells. And then we have green um, hydrogen production at this, this portal project as well. So frankly, the full-size truck, you can fill it up in a couple of minutes. It can go 500 miles. It's got twice the power of a diesel truck and zero wow. emissions. That's a game changer. So that that's we're getting off track a little bit, but that's no, but that, is, that is on track because when we talk about Long Beach and we talk about those portals and we talk about, you know, we did a big EMA with the Harvard School of Public Health about what those diesel dust emissions does to kids living in surrounding areas. Yes. That's a huge deal. It's a huge deal for that community. It's a really huge deal. A hundred percent. So so fuel cell electric vehicle is one. I think yep. you nailed that. Battery electric vehicle is another. Now, battery electric, I'll just say Tesla, right? Battery electric, it, it runs on a, has a huge battery in it. Yep. Ranges vary, but they all have to get plugged in. And the only source of power is battery. Zero yeah. emission. The vehicle yeah. has zero emission. The other two electrified powertrains that I mentioned are a plug-in hybrid. Now, this is what, uh, we have that in a couple of models, and we're going to be introducing a lot more models because it's great technology. Uh, Prius Prime is a plug-in hybrid. RAV4 Prime is a plug-in hybrid. Basically, you, it's a hybrid vehicle, but it has a larger battery. So it enables you to plug the vehicle into a charging station or your, your garage at your home. And you can get anywhere from 20 to 42 miles of e zero emission EV only range. Yep. So in a RAV4, five passenger SUV, no compromise vehicle, you can go 40 miles on EV only. The average person commutes about 24 miles. But then on the weekends or summer vacations with the kids, you have, you know, 600 miles of range with the gas and it turns into a very fuel efficient, you know, 40 miles per gallon little SUV. Um, so that's a great solution for people that don't have multiple vehicles in the household, maybe don't have a garage to plug it into, you know, every day with their, their EV. Um, so it's a one vehicle solution that can, can give you zero emissions for most of the time and then rely on that gas powertrain hybrid system so that that's when you need to. So that's plug in hybrid. Yeah, that's exactly what my wife has. And that's exactly the solution because she does daily driving and it always is on the battery. And yep. the weekends, if we go to Santa Barbara or someplace, we don't have to worry about that. I don't know. Yep. The, what's it called? The battery life anxiety. There's a real For range. Thing. Range. range anxiety. Anxiety. <laughs> You're just like doing the math going, am I going to make it home? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, that is our solution. So that's yeah, number yeah. three. Then what's the fourth one? The, the fourth one is hybrid, which is simply Prius. Right. So it's a hybrid electric vehicle. It uses a, a gasoline internal combustion engine with a series of motor generators and a battery to store electricity. So as, as you're slowing down, your, your vehicle is using that kinetic energy to recharge the battery and store that energy. Your brakes aren't really used that much, frankly. Prius brakes last <laughs> for a long, long time because it's electrical resistance that's recharging the battery that's slowing the vehicle down. So it increases efficiency dramatically. That's what my mom's been rocking for 25 years, calling me to say, I got 56 miles per gallon on my Prius. I was like, there you go. Great. I got eight in my, my giant SUV. Just, just tell her, please don't drive in the fast lane while you're trying to get 56 miles per gallon. That goes down to 42. So what is the plans? I know you can't go into the, the vault box of the 10 year, but what is the plan for electrification for, for Toyota? What can well, you we have, we have big plans. Number one, we've been at electrification for decades and we are super excited that it's now a topic of conversation. And it used to be, I mean, I remember being made fun of by other car companies yeah. about the Prius science, you know, they're making fun of us. Yeah. So the fact that now everybody is on this bandwagon and to the extent maybe pushing us a little bit, we're excited. We've always wanted to move 
our society to a carbon free environment, you know, sustainability. We've had this goal for decades. And so what we're doing is pretty aggressive. And I, I can't emphasize enough the scale that needs to be built to support a global automotive industry. The number of battery factories that have to be built. I mean, Toyota for 22 consecutive years, we've sold more vehicles with batteries in them than any car company. So we build more batteries than anybody. So we already have pretty good infrastructure, lots of partnerships. But even for us to reach our electrified goals, we're gonna have, I mean, the math is, is staggering. Um, the industry in the US, it's roughly five to seven new battery factories every year for the next 10 years that have to be built to build the capacity for all these batteries. It's just, the scale is enormous. So it can't be a hockey stick growth. We have to build infrastructure. We have to figure out how to get raw materials out of the ground that don't destroy the planet. You know, we don't, okay. the amount of strip mining and, you know, all those problems we have to overcome. We have to overcome lithium ion technology. We need a better technology that's lighter weight and more energy dense. You, you talked about that 70 billion going into research and development. You talked about 30 vehicles coming out between now and, and, and 3030. Is there one vehicle specifically that you're really excited about or can talk about in that 30 vehicles? Oh, look at that smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we're, uh, I think tomorrow is the global debut of the first Lexus EV. Um, and we're going to be going on sale uh, in a few months here with the first, with actually the third Toyota EV. Um, people don't realize that, but you know we've had two generations of Rav4 electric vehicles, yep. and uh, that was a decade ago. You know, and I think they were a little ahead of their time. But so it's not the first EV for Toyota; it'll be our third EV. Um, but these two vehicles are important for us. We think it. Our, our strategy for EVs might be different than other companies, but we're looking at having Toyota levels of long-term quality, dependability, reliability, fit and finish, durability, that's our DNA. And we're not gonna sacrifice that as we move to different powertrains. Um, you know, we, we have gone public with our engineering targets to maintain 90% of the initial range on a battery electric vehicle for 10 years. 90%. 90% of initial range after 10 years of operation. So the benefit to society is the total number of miles that you can get out of that battery. If, if, you, if you use that battery in a way that causes degradation, and if it's down to 60% or 50% after 10 years, you're probably going to have to replace the battery and the resources needed and the environmental impact of replace. It's not good. So, you know, some of our products, maybe they won't have the eye popping initial range of others, but over time, ours are not going to degradate. And I'm not claiming that others are, I don't know what they're planning, but I can tell you, we think our 90% is going to be industry leading. And yeah. so that's going to be on BZ4X. It's going to be on the RZ that launches tomorrow. Um, those two products, they're SUVs, get great functionality, it's no excuses. They're going to get between 200 and 252 miles of pure battery electric range, and they're going to be a great value. So I'm super excited about those products, but frankly, it's just the beginning. You know, if you go back and look at our first generation Prius and then what Prius turned into, and, and now you don't hear a lot about Prius, but that technology is on a quarter of everything we sell. It's on Tundras, right? It, it's on Sequoias. It's on Highlanders. It's, it, I mean, we have 18 different models, I won't list them all off, that have that hybrid technology that was pioneered with Prius. So I look at these two vehicles that we're starting off with now, they're great products, but we're gonna get a lot better and a lot more competitive as we Kaizen and continue to improve our portfolio. So I'd love to give you some details on a car coming five years from now, but this would be the last time I could interview on behalf of Toyota. So I really like to <laughs> I don't that. want to cost you your job. I don't want to, I don't want to risk that. The future is bright. Yeah, no, let's talk bright. about that. 
<laughs> but it is but it is it's got to be the most exciting time to be in the auto industry just based on like the breakthrough technologies whether you're talking about evs whether you're talking about fuel cell whether you're talking about solid state batteries like this is this is a, a, a space race at this point like it's really oh, exciting it is and, and in our world um i'm super excited about being in this having this responsibility at this time but parts of me are a little jealous of you know 10 years ago it was you know what size wheels and how are you going to bend the sheet metal and right do does the suv need to be bigger now it's you know autonomous technology yep. it's connected cockpits and everything we can do for a guest experience through the new technology it's powertrain electrification that there's no silver bullet bottom line is we have to always remember that nothing happens until a customer writes a check for a car. And we can come up with all the science experiments and you know anybody can build a $200,000 EV, but you need scale to impact the environment. You need scale. So that's our strategy. You know that one reason why I mentioned our BZ4X might not get eye popping range is because it's not a good use of natural resources to put a battery in a vehicle that takes you 400 miles when the average customer commutes 24 miles a day. You're carrying around that weight that you can build two or three EVs and sell more of them. And that's that scale has been a formula for success um, for ours. I'll, I'll give you a little math. I know this will this will twist math. your head a little bit. No, I love math. I love it. You love math? Okay. So and maybe I could have used this for one of your first questions, but the reality is when people say, hey, how come Toyota doesn't sell EVs? Well, our goal is greenhouse gas reduction. Our goal is carbon neutrality. Our goal is not to implement any one solution for consumers. So here, here's the math. Um, we've sold 18 million hybrids. Over, over the last 20 years. And you, the, the environmental benefit of those hybrids is easily measured. And then you can look at that in, in the amount of the tons of CO2 yep. that have not gone into the environment as a result of that, taking customers out of normal cars and putting them in these hybrid cars, right? Huge reduction. Well, you can look at that and create an equivalent to how many EVs that represents so zero emission vehicles right and it's 5.5 million so the reality is toyota has sold 5.5 million battery electric vehicles that's the benefit to society and to the environment that we've given yep but it's because we've sold 18 million hybrids yep so we're committed but that's not where it gets interesting where it gets really interesting is natural resources and how precious they are. The battery material that we used to build 18 million hybrids, if we would have used that same amount of battery material to build battery electric vehicles, because the batteries are so big, we, we could have only built 260,000. So I know this is just get your head wrapped around this. So for the natural resources, to build 260,000 zero emission battery electric vehicles, we have given the planet the benefit of 5.5 million zero emission vehicles. So it's, it's all about meeting customers' needs, giving them a, a vehicle that, that's environmentally friendly that they don't have to think about. They, you know, we don't want people to compromise their lifestyle for a car. We want to deliver environmental friendliness and at an affordable price, peace of mind, no excuses. So that's kind of a, a mind bender, those what I just told you, but it <laughs> it's true. 200, 260,000. Yeah. So if you if you were to do the math of, of greenhouse gas emissions, that's a difference of five uh, five hundred five million two hundred and forty thousand. That, yes. that you got this scrape from from the going into the atmosphere. Yeah. Yes, we gave the benefit of whatever that number you just said 
uh, an additional benefit to the right. 260,000 that we could have built. And look, if you the more you dig into these rare earth metals and where they're coming from and who owns a supply chain, um, yeah. it's concerning. Yeah. Um, it's concerning where where the money flows to yeah. stand up um, the infrastructure needed for this. You know, we, we need America to have a strong economy. We need to figure out how to how to build batteries. I mean, that, yeah. I mean if I was in D.C., <laughs> I'd be I'd be pushing hard on where are the raw materials coming from, where are the factory is going to be built, how do we how do we fast track this because we need a way to ramp up domestic production of of capacity to build batteries. Batteries are and the precious metals needed for batteries. Um, that's a huge hurdle. I'm going to put together a, 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 an LLC and we're going to start buying land in southern Mongolia. <laughs> just to start mining to be the first source of all the stuff that's necessary to, to do this. Um, because yes, the globalization uh, uh, and where we're pulling um, a lot of these materials from is complex, not only from a financial standpoint, but from, I mean, a moral standpoint as well. I, I get that. Yeah, um, yeah, geopolitical ramifications, it's, it's a big deal. But think, yeah. about, think about the precious metals that go into batteries as oil. And over the last couple of centuries, you know, what, what has the control of oil done to global power shifts? And that's the interesting way to look at who owns the global mining rights of cobalt and lithium and all these other, you know, it's like, huh. Yeah, that's a really succinct way of putting it. And it makes it digestible, I think, for everybody, which is we know the price of oil and what that does for our foreign policy. And this is the same thing. And it is the new frontier of that. So let's solve it now before we end up, you know, handcuffed by our, our necessities. Um, oh, good point. Um, can you, uh, for those people that are still doing the math in their head, you know, obviously we're going to see higher prices than traditional vehicles. Consumers buying one of these EVs versus a standard gas automobile. Yeah. I think that's easier to do now just based on gas prices. So if it's not a choice based on the environment and it's just yeah. a choice based on finances, do you have a succinct way of talking about how, how that, how that's made up? Um, there's a lot that goes into how a customer views value. Um, and, you know, I mean, you'd be maybe surprised to know that many people that buy EVs today, they're not buying them because of the environmental benefit. Now, that might be somewhere on the list, um, but their top reasons are technological advancement in the in cabin, you know, experience. It's fun to drive acceleration. I mean, these EVs are accelerating like rocket ships. It's, it's crazy. Um, so I, I think the key is building a portfolio of products that will meet those customers' needs. And some customers, um, it's all about the monthly payment. And I, I, don't, I don't care what it runs on. If, if you can only afford X amount, you're, you're going to buy that vehicle. Um, now, it is true with EVs that customers go through the thought process of, oh, maybe I'll save a little bit with maintenance. Maybe, maybe I'll save a little bit with, with gas, you know, especially with gas prices this high. So that, that moves the needle. But over time, affordability is affordability. The monthly payments for cars um, have, have gone up over time, but the escalation in, in prices is going to go up even higher with all of the precious metals and EV. So we have to be creative and figure out how customers can afford those cars. And frankly, you know, you think about old, you know, 10 years ago, one of the things you paid a lot more for in a car was horsepower, right? Do you want the four cylinder or do you want the V6, you know? Well, I think the way to look at the battery electric space into the future, that's gonna be range. Mm. You know, so, some people will be able to afford a car that gets 500 miles of range, but some people can only afford a car that gets 150. So the 150 range car shouldn't be looked down upon as, oh, well, how come your range isn't farther? Well, because of the battery resources and the weight and the affordability, if that customer drives 20 miles a day or 30 or 40 or 50 miles a day, and they have a second vehicle in their, in their garage to do long trips, then that's an awesome solution for that customer. But right now, the thinking is it's all range, 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 range. And I, I think that's going to have to change because yeah. range costs a lot of money. It's like I said, it's, to me, it's like 
horsepower used to be, it's going to be range. So I think to be affordable, we need to offer various range options for consumers um, and, and, and then have them in the vehicle configurations. We need to have small, affordable vehicles like Corollas. And obviously for more affluent customers, we need to have vehicles that meet their lifestyle. So it's a, it's a broad portfolio approach. Is it fair to say, that was really succinct. Is it fair to say half the range, half the battery size, half the natural resources? Uh, for the battery itself, that's probably yes. If you look at the overall vehicle, it's not quite that dramatic because the overall vehicle still takes resources to build. The sheet metal is the same, the tires right. the same. Right. So yes, on the battery itself, it's yeah, that, that, that sounds reasonable. Yep. So, that, that so you could build a 300 mile car versus a 150 mile car. Um, you, you can build, actually you can build more than two of the 150 mile car because the bigger a battery gets, batteries are really heavy. I mean, really, really heavy. So the bigger the battery gets, the heavier it gets. So therefore the more energy that it needs just to mm. carry itself around. Oh yeah. So as, as you, so, so if you go from a 300 mile battery to 150 mile battery, you might be able to get 2.1 or 2.2 of the 150 mile vehicles out of that one. I, I don't know how that math exactly is going to work out, but I think you get my point. You know, I get your point exactly. It makes total sense. And if this is this is now three topics that I've never thought about that way. And that's this, I will use these in my life. So now when you talk about carbon footprint, um, as far as operations uh, and dealerships, do you have a plan for that? What's that look like for you guys? Yeah, uh, we do. And, um, you know, from a carbon emissions standpoint, you know, I, I see different numbers on this, but I think the automotive sector puts out somewhere around 15% um, of, of carbon emissions, but, you know, buildings and manufacturing facilities, I think put out more than that you know, on, on total. So that's a huge deal. And we've been committed to that for a long time. And I won't give you a laundry list of things, but there's, there's different aspects. You know, we, we have a very large number of suppliers and we go to our suppliers and we actually linked their emissions back to the baseline of 2018. So we've been at this for a while. And with all of our suppliers, we've said every year, you have to reduce your carbon emissions by at least two percentage points until they're, they're at zero, right? So, so the suppliers, you know, and the, the first few years will probably be easy, <laughs> but yeah. the closer you get to zero, the harder it's gonna get. So that's all of our suppliers. That's the expectation that, that, we, that we have there. Um, and then our own facilities, you know, we've, we've made a target and I forget what year it is by, but to reduce our CO2 by 25% from the 2018 levels. Um, and then our dealerships, you know, we work with our dealerships, they're independently owned, um, but they're great business partners of ours. And, you know, we don't pay for dealership facilities. They pay for their own facilities. And it speak vol speaks volumes of the Toyota dealer network. Um, there's, a, there's an environmental certification called LEED, L-E-E-D. Okay, yeah. familiar. Um, we have more LEED certified dealers than any other brand by a long shot. Now, the problem is it's only 58 out of 1,200, but we have a lot of construction projects in place. And the learnings from those uh, green facilities a lot of the learnings have been adopted by other stores, even though they didn't go through the certification process to become lead. So, you know, it's an all of the above um, uh, problem that we're trying to solve here. So all of those components are, are important. And the end game, this was announced a decade ago, I, I lose track, but we had put down 2050 as a point in time where we want all of Toyota to be net positive. Now, that's, that might sound like a long time, but you got to take into consideration the units and operation we have in the world and automobiles. I mean, it's look at all the, so when we say, you know, that, inc when we say net positive, that means we have to account for all vehicles that have been sold in the history of Toyota, plus all the new vehicles that we are building, 
plus all the factory and assemblies. So our, our new vehicles and our factories and assembly plants have to be a net positive to overcome maybe a 20 year old car yep. that happens to be a hybrid. So that's been our challenge for a long time and it's not gonna be easy, but, but we're making good progress. Yeah, that's exciting. That's gonna, I mean, there's gonna have to be some sort of scientific breakthrough of something to do that. Yeah. But, but it doesn't matter because the philosophy is what matters, right? And it's the same thing with, with you know, talking to your uh, suppliers, which is that's not a financial based decision. If you do a 2% reduction in your carbon emissions every year, that's not about finance. That's about, you know, protecting what the planet looks like in, 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 in the next hundred years. So I commend yeah. both of those philosophies. And I think echo what it is you said at the top of this, which is that this has been deep in our DNA for, you know, if it's been around for 25 years and it's 10 years of development before that, it's 35 years of saying we got to do the right thing. Yeah. Wait, so the, the, you said that the, the Tundra, that there is a new Tundra TRD Pro that uses the technology of the original Prius. Am I right? It's a, is there a, it's a dual hybrid or what is it? Yeah, it's, it's a hybrid. And I'll tell you, we made a strategy change in hybrid about uh, five years ago. Um, the Prius, for as good as it was, it was really tuned to maximize fuel efficiency. But what we found is people want to have fun driving their car and people will pay for better performance. So when we introduced the RAV4 hybrid, um, I mean, we're gonna sell, I don't know, 150,000, 200,000 RAV4 hybrids. I mean, it is amazing. We tuned the hybrid system so you got better acceleration than the gas. It's quieter, smoother, drives better. You get a bunch better fuel economy, but it's faster, right? So that changed things for hybrid. And we, we, we did that to start to overcome the hybrid being viewed as a wimpy powertrain. It's like, ah, oh, you really got, you know, yeah, it's great if you're willing to go zero to 60 in nine seconds, right? We don't, we don't want that. So I'm telling you this story because the Tundra is this new type of hybrid. It's called iForce Max. It uses a twin turbo V6 high efficiency, high thermal efficiency engine paired with what we call a one motor hybrid. It's a very large electric drive motor. The result is a vehicle that has, I don't know, maybe 20% increase in fuel economy from the old Tundra, uh, maybe 25%, a pretty sizable increase. Yet it has 583 pound feet of torque. And I wanna say, don't quote me on this, 447 or 437 horsepower. So it is a massively powerful, you know, tow 12,000 pounds, no excuse vehicle, fun to drive, but it's a hybrid. So yes, that's a standard powertrain in TRD Pro. Um, you can also get it in your 1794. Um, and we're, we just now started producing um, uh, the hybrid variant. It was delayed a few months to get the plant ready. Uh, but I think actually this week was the first hybrid tundra that lined off so they're going to be coming out the stores now quickly that's um my character on ncsla drives a a, a ram truck that's obviously not a hybrid i told him no. I was like, we're gonna we're gonna switch this thing to this <laughs> new hybrid that'd be awesome pr pro we're, we're we're working on it yeah the show's, the show's got internationally 100 million viewers i think we should be driving a hybrid instead of a gas guzzler Awesome. And, that's, and that solar octane doesn't mess around. That's the one of the prettiest cars. My son is like, is that a real car or is that a toy? And I was like, it's a little bit of both. Sorry, my phone is going crazy. No problem. Work. Um, so uh, the last question, because you've had everything so succinctly uh, said, and it's, it's worth asking this as well. If I have a friend who still can't wrap their heads around uh, considering an alternative fuel vehicle, what's the best way to do it? What's the, 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 the whisper, the two, the two second whisper to get somebody to do it? Well, um, I live in Texas. Yeah. You got the toughest I, crowd. I, I, I've got friends in my neighborhood and they're, you know, F-350 this yeah. and three quarter ton diesel that. And, you know, the, and the first thing they say is I'm not getting an EV and I don't argue, I don't combat that. Um, 
I then start talking to them about, hey, let me take you for a ride in this Tundra and see what you think. I don't tell them it's a hybrid. And I take them for a ride in different vehicles, like the, the NX um, plug-in hybrid is, is an amazingly powerful product, just like the RAV4. And, and they're like, wow, this thing's amazing. It's like, yeah, this is an uh, electrified powertrain. So there's, there's more to going electrified and helping the environment than just going straight to EV. So I, I guess at the end of the day, if a customer can fit an EV into their lifestyle, um, then they should do it, right? I mean, it's, do you, are you affluent? Can you afford that car? Do you have multiple vehicles in the household that allow you to, to do long trips and things? Um, absolutely do it. But if you're not in that situation, hybrids are a great opportunity to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's plug-in hybrids. So I, I think it's a portfolio and, and people should just open their eyes to looking for those types of technologies. Um, because they're out there. I, I would, I would, I would say there's a fuel efficient, environmentally friendly option out there for pretty much any customer need if they really look hard enough. But the awareness isn't there, right? I mean, we're just started selling the Tundra. They might not be aware of it. They might not understand what a hybrid is. I mean, we we still have customers in showrooms that ask, well, it's an electric hybrid. Do I have to plug it in? And it's like, no, it, you know, you don't just drive it. It gets good fuel economy. Oh, OK. All right. So despite being out there for decades, the level of education on these various technologies is pretty low. And so we just need to do a better job in educating consumers. And I'll tell you an industry challenge. We're pretty much the only hybrid game in town. So we have to carry the water on explaining to people how great an option hybrid is um, you know, as we ramp up and move to an electrified future, eventually we'll get the ICE engines out. But until we get there, hybrid's a fantastic option. So I think it's just opening their eyes to the possibilities out there. Number one, we don't want people to sacrifice their lifestyle around a vehicle. We, we want to enhance their lifestyle, life, lifestyle. We want to give them more joy and, and more peace of mind with their vehicle. So Find a vehicle that meets your needs and see if you can find an electrified version and they're out there if you look. It's funny, I ask that question a lot, you know, with every every one of these that we do. And no matter what the sector is, whether it's agriculture, whether it's um, no matter what it is, uh, public health, the answer is always communication. It's not, it's literally just trying to have a conversation with somebody and showing them the possibilities. And then human nature usually kicks in, especially when it comes down to a financial situation in which it does make sense. And you look at, you know, you, you talk about somebody's monthly um, payment, you know, I fill my truck up now, it's 166 bucks. So yeah. it starts becoming logic and communication and finance. And that's, I think, the tipping point into, all right, we're on the right side of this thing. And by the time we get to 2050, if we really are, you know, net positive, we got a shot. Yep. That's it for me, man. Anything else you want to say? Anything else you want to talk about? No, this was fun. Um, you know, it wasn't scripted. So I think we got some good uh, off the top of your, our head uh, conversation and and you caught on really quickly for, for somebody from Eugene. So I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Well, I was only there for two years. My dad, was, oh. <laughs> my dad was getting his PhD, and then all I have is pictures. And then I went back to Iowa. So Iowa, <laughs> Iowa's a lot like Texas. We got a lot of, a lot of boys and girls running around with those dualies and three fifties. And yeah. once you start talking about math, that's where my, that's my brain just kicks in and goes like, and that's unbelievable to me that 18 million vehicles sold as a hybrid model. Uh, you know, is it to 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 take that. Uh, and put that into strict EVs being 260,000. Like the difference of that, just that's incredible. And a tribute to, to that model in which you're still doing hybrids because it makes sense, not only from a financial standpoint for your consumers, but also from a, from a global uh, gas, greenhouse gas emissions. 